We left off where Paul had called all the elders of Ephesus together. And they were gathered in this. And as they were gathered together, Paul told them that he was leaving and he wouldn't see him anymore. And there, as he declared these things to them, he warned them. He let them know that there's going to be some people rising up among them that will actually be used to, uh, to teach doctrine that was not contrary to, to uh, what Paul had taught or to Scripture. And that there would be those that would try to draw disciples onto themselves. And Paul gave a, a warning to them in this way. Yet he commended them to the Lord. He knew, Lord, I, I can't control every situation. I can't control all the things. And I, I just would just, I'm just too tired in trying. And so, Lord, I'm commending them into your hands. I'm trusting you to work out all the details. Even though Paul anticipated problems. And he knew, you're going to have problems. I'd have been like, so I'm staying with you and to make sure it's not going to happen. And, and, you know, like by my will, I can do anything. But, but that's how we feel. Like, I'm going to control every situation so everything works to the best. Well, it doesn't work out well. It's better when you can give the advice, the counsel, the instruction. As Paul said, I, I, I never failed to give you all these things. But what I have to do is commend you, commit you, bring you before the Lord. Let him take care of it. And to the word which you have and which he shared, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to the Lord and, and I have to move on because God's called me to do other things as well. And so Paul was able to truly let the church of Ephesus, who he cared for greatly, to be in God's hands. And there is many people and things and situations you care for greatly. But you've got to let them be in God's hands. You're just going to burn yourself out, get yourself upset, and cause great frustration if you don't give it to the Lord. And so he did. And he gave it to the Lord. And he said, Lord, I commend you to God. He says in verse 32 of chapter 20, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified, those that have believed in the Lord and set apart. And so that's good advice for us. And so Paul did. He, they all wept and they were sad because he said he wasn't going to see them anymore. And he left. And we pick it up in chapter 21. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, from the elders of Ephesus, and had launched, we came straight course to Cuz. And the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. So Luke is writing this, and he's just giving you a little bit of the, the journey that they traveled by ship and how they continued because Paul in his heart was set on a course to go to Jerusalem. That's where he wanted to end up and he even had a desire to be there at the festival of Pentecost. And so he had in his heart to travel and he had a, a, a route mapped out and he was taken off to get there. And Luke has given us the details in verse 3, and now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. So they were on a ship, and the ships would carry cargo. And Luke is just saying, as we traveled, we went by these areas, and Cyprus was on the left, and then we uh, came and we went to Tyre and we stopped there because they had to unload the cargo in that area at that port. 
And then it says in verse 4, and finding disciples, we tarried there. So when they stopped at Tyree, they found believers in Christ. And so they tarried, they said, okay, well, we have to stay, let's stay here and let's lodge here for a little bit. And they did. And they stayed there seven days. Who said to Paul, now this is really interesting. Who said to Paul through the Spirit, it, 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 most translations will capitalize that word Spirit because it's referring to the Holy Spirit, not the Spirit that's within them in, in their own spirit or their own feelings or desires or, or any of that, but through the Spirit, the Spirit of God, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now that's an interesting verse because it's pretty clear that the Spirit of God told Paul, don't go. Now, Paul had a great desire to be in Jerusalem, and he wanted to go to show the, the love of Christ to his people, the Jews. He, he had such a burden for the Jews, though God primarily called him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the the non-Jews, if you would. He had such a burden to go and talk to the Jews that he was determined, I'm going to get there, I'm going to go, and, and they're going to see the truth, just like I saw the truth when Jesus dropped me on the road to Damascus and revealed himself to me, and, and they're going to understand and how many times I went into the synagogues and I, and I wrestled with them through the scriptures to show that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised, and I'm going to go to Jerusalem because I have such a heart for the Jews that he could not see he may have been going outside of God's will. How, how, how can I be out of God's will? I, I want to do good. The, the actions I'm taking are, are not sinful by themselves. It, I want to do something good. And yet, it may not have been God's will for him to go and do that. And so the disciples of Christ, through the Spirit of God, told him, do not go. And yet, if you read in the next verse, and when they had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. He, he couldn't hear them. He, he couldn't hear what they had to say. He he was so determined in his heart to go to, to be with the, the Jews at the day of Pentecost, and he was, he was interrupted. His first initial heart within him was be there at Passover. Well, that didn't work out. And he didn't see that as maybe the Lord closing the door. He saw it as, well, well then, then I'm going to be there for, for Pentecost. That's when I'm going to show up. And he was determined to go. And he had a good heart. He, he wasn't trying to go do anything wrong. He wanted to go share the gospel with his people. And so he continued to, to go his way and, and continue on his journey. In fact, as you look in Scripture, in the previous chapter, chapter 20, and we just read a couple verses here. In 22 it says, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit, in His Spirit. In, in His own desire and determination. I was bound in, in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city that bonds and afflictions abide me but none of these things moved me neither counted i my life dear unto me that i may finish my course with joy and the ministry which i have received of the lord to testify the gospel of grace of god well we know that paul at one time was determined to go to asia and preach the gospel and the holy spirit came directly to him and said no and that he got okay i guess the way he's blocked 
And he saw a man from Macedonia saying, come this way. And so here, I truly, this is my belief through Scripture, is that the Lord had a different path for Paul than the path that Paul chose. That, that God had told Paul, you're going to go to Rome. That, that that's where you're going to go. And, and yet Paul was determined that he should go to Jerusalem first because he had such a, a desire to preach the gospel to the Jews. Very strong desire to preach the gospel to the Jews. And so in verse 5 again it says, And we had accomplished those days, and we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with rivers, or with wives, rivers, sorry. Those flowing rivers you're married to. And wives and children, till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. You know, just as a side note, it's always nice when you're visiting with believers that at the end you pray together and you depart with prayer. It's just a, just a nice thing to do. I, I like it when we can just pray at the end and, and depart that way. And they kneeled down and they prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and we returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Tamalias and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And so here, Philip the evangelist, one of them that were deacons and helpers of the church, he, he's evangelist, he's preaching the gospel, God's sending him different places, and we abode with him, and look what it says, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, we came down from Judea, and a certain prophet named Agabus, and he was there. Now, Agabus is familiar to us. If you remember back in Acts 11, and we could just take a quick peek there. If you turn to Acts chapter 11, and you see in verse 27, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth or, or famine throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So they wanted to send some money and help to them which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, the apostle. So Paul is familiar with Agabus. Paul ends up saying, you know, believe in Agabus' prophecy to the point where he received those funds to bring them to the, the saints and the brethren in Jerusalem. And now Agabus is on the scene again, if you jump back to chapter 21. And he's on the scene, and look what it says in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And when he was come unto us, Agabus, he took Paul's belt, they call it a girdle, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind a man that owneth this bell and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here he declares that this is what's going to happen to the man that goes to Jerusalem, to Paul the apostle. 
you're going to find yourself bound up, put in prison, and there, as we know, you're going to go through various trials on your trip to Rome where I've called you to be. And Paul was very determined, you know, in his own spirit when he heard this. And then Paul answered, What mean you to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I am determined to do this. I'm even willing to die if that's what God has for me. Well, I think God already told him what he had for him, and he said, don't go to Jerusalem. So God already kind of told him, you don't go. But if you do go, trouble, torment, torture, imprisonment. And Paul's like, I don't care. Send as many as you want. I'm going. You know, he's determined to go. And I thought, wow, what, what has God shown us in this? I truly believe that Paul, by the Spirit of God, was not to go, because that's what the Scripture says. But yet, God, in his sovereignty, he already knew Paul was going to go. He already knew he would go. So he told him, all right. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be this, this, and this, and you're going to be bound up, and there's going to be a rough time. And, and I've always believed in Scripture of man's free will and God's sovereignty. I, I see them both. And, and, and I see them not exclusive of one another. I see God created it in, in a perfect, unique way. And the only example that I can really give at this time is back when I was, uh, when I was a much younger man and I was in the field of electronics and I remember in one of my courses in the industry that I learned a, a, a computer language called BASIC. And BASIC language, I would write programs and in the basic language, they would have different control signals that were called if and then. And, and some also add else. But if and then. And we would sit down and write programs on different scenarios that would happen. If this happened, then that. And you would have some other commands of go to and stop. And we would write these flow charts, and we would have to walk through every scenario that might happen and then write a program to anticipate all the scenarios and then to bring an end result down whatever path was decided or chosen. And I kind of see how the Lord is so incredible that he knows every path that a person may take and has determined that past result or outcome. His sovereignty, his, his, you know, he's Lord. But yet, he gives man the free will of saying, choose the path. This is what I want for you. But if you choose differently, I already have predetermined an end result for you on that path. It's still the sovereignty of God, yet given man that, that ability of free will. And here God has determined each path. And he said to Paul, Paul, you're going to go to Rome. All right, I told you that. You're going to Rome. Now, but I'm telling you, don't go to Rome by the way of Jerusalem. All right? Don't go that way. But if you go to Jerusalem, then I have determined that your trip to Rome would be bound as a prisoner with trials along the way. You, you have... Paul making a choice whether to obey God or not, but God yet determining and, and, and preordaining every outcome that man could ever possibly conceive. He, he, he's God. He knows all things. 
He's like, okay, what are you going to do? I'm going to Rome. All right. And then all the people, you're going to be bound. You're going to be in chains. You're going to be in prison. I don't care. I'm still going. And I couldn't help but think of another Old Testament example of a man named Jonah. Jonah, you're going to go to Nineveh and you're going to tell them they need to repent. And Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. And God said, you can go to Nineveh two ways. Okay? You can go up the coast on the Mediterranean cruise line and enjoy the ride and get to Nineveh and do what I told you to. Or, if you don't choose that path, then let me tell you what's already predetermined for you. You can choose to go to Nineveh in the digestive juices of a great fish and be vomited on the beach of Nineveh. The choice is yours. I, I've determined both outcomes. I, I've ordained all scenarios. What do you choose? Well, I, I think I'm going to go into the great fish. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Joppa and sail to Tarshish, like way in the other direction. Okay. And I've come to realize and wonder, why... So many times do I choose the belly of a fish. Why do I choose the belly of a fish? When God has a better plan. And yet God knows it all. And God's in control of it all. And God has preordained everything. And yet I've chosen the belly of the great fish. Uh, through God's sanctifying work over the years in my life, I have learned a little bit. I've opted for the Mediterranean cruise line over the great fish in the belly of the, the great fish. But God is so sovereign, and he was telling Paul along the way, Paul, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to preach to kings and you're going to preach to the Gentiles. And along the way, you did preach to the Jews. You went into every synagogue and you preached to them and many believed. But you are determined, you are stubborn and you're determined you're going to do this. And I, and I stepped in with believers through my Holy Spirit and said, don't go. And you're like, I don't hear you. I'm determined to go. Okay. Well, I have determined another path for you if you're going to go. You're going to be in chains and you're going to go through shipwrecks and snake bites and you're going to go through a harder course, but in the end, you're going to get to Rome because that's what I have determined. But I've given you a little bit of free will to choose which path. But yet every path I've already determined as well, so you choose. And so many times we choose the hard way. And it's like, Lord, teach me not to do that. Teach me to, to recognize your voice. And, and I got to tell you, I'm grateful along the way that God has sent some of you, brothers and sisters, into my life to share with me some of the things of the Lord to help me avoid some of those uh, journeys by the whale's belly, you know, or great fish. But Paul had a choice. And I see that unplay as we move on, if you're wondering, because I think Paul was blinded and he was about to do something that I believe was, would have been a great sin against God if he fulfilled it in the journey that he chose. So let's, let's continue this as we uh, try to bring the message to a, to a close. And when he would not be persuaded we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. I commend you to God, Paul. The will of God be done. And, and God had a will. Let me, let me really get you to know this. 
God had his will if Paul chose not to go to Jerusalem. But God had his will if Paul chose to go to Jerusalem. You can't take away the sovereignty of God. He is God. And yet within it, he would have us to choose this day whom we will serve, that we would serve him and listen to his voice. And, and I got to confess to you, not every time do I do that. I sometimes listen to my voice. And, and yet God has a lesson along that path for me. Because in the end, he's a good God. And let's see how good he is as this unfolds for Paul. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one, um, min, or, um, one Nasum of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. That's what I want to be, kind of an old disciple, you know. There's Kirk, that old disciple, yeah, just sitting out there thinking about the Lord. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So he's saying, I'm so glad you ministered to the Gentiles, but I got to tell you, there's a lot of Jews in the city, and they believe in Messiah, but yet they're still very zealous to the law. They, they, they believe, well, that's fine if those Gentiles don't have to follow our law, but we as Jews have to follow the letter of the law to the end of it, all of it, even though we believe in Jesus. Now, that's not necessarily true because some of the things that they would follow would, would, would kind of be a slap in the face to the Messiah coming, and we'll see that. But they were very zealous to the law, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews that are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their custom. Well, he didn't. He just said that that's not what God looks on. God doesn't look in, on the, the circumcision of, of man. He looks on the circumcision of the heart. God doesn't look on you keeping a certain day. Some keep a day to the Lord, some not keep the day unto the Lord. Let everyone be persuaded in their own heart how God leads them. He, he, he's not necessarily coming against. He's just saying that, those things were shadows of things to come. And so they didn't like that. The Jews, they're like, you're teaching against the law of Moses. And so those in Jerusalem told them that there are those that believe that and think you're doing that, and that you're forsaking Moses, saying that they all not circumcise the children, neither walk after the customs. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs to come together, for they will hear that you are come. Man, you are going to stir up a, a, a problem here if you don't get in line and let them know that you're a, a good Jew. You're, you're a good law-following Jewish believer. And he said, they're going to know you come. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Now this vow was probably a Nazarite vow, and I want you to know a little bit real quickly on what the Nazareth vow is. But if you look at Numbers chapter 6, I'm only going to read a couple verses because I want to finish the text where I'm at. Numbers chapter 6, in verse 13, or you don't have to turn, you can listen if you want. In verse 13 it says, And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled... He shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. 
and one ram without blush, um, blemish for a peace offering. And then it goes on on other offerings and that he's to shave his head and purify himself. Well, we see also when they would purify the leper, and you can see that in Leviticus 14, verses 8 through 13, I was going to read, but you can look that up, that they would purify themselves for seven days, then they would offer an offering, a sacrificial offering for the Lord for a sin offering. So here, whatever vow, which is probably a Nazarite vow, if you look back at Acts, they had taken, that it says, them take, in verse 24 of chapter 21, them take and purify themselves with them and be at charges with them. What that means is, Paul, what you can do to bring peace among the Jews here is that you can be one who would say, see, I don't disregard the law, in fact, I'm going to join these men who have a Nazarite vow that's coming to an end. I'm going to join them. I'm going to purify myself. I'm going to shave my head. And I'm going to pay for all the expenses for them to end this vow, which not only included the shaving of the head, but purchasing the sacrifices for the offering. And they said, Paul, if you do this, they will see that you are a good Jew who still keeps and believes in the law of God, that, that you're a good Jew. So would you do this for us? And Paul had such a heart for the Jewish people that he wanted to see them saved and didn't want them to be stumbled that he agreed to this. And I believe it was wrong for him to do that. In fact, if you read here, as you continue, as we continue this, that and to be at charge with them, that they might shave their heads, and that all may know those things whereof where they were informed concerning thee are nothing. That that you're not teaching against the law, and they all realize it was just hearsay, just idle gossip, and they had no truth to it but that thou thyself also walkest ordering, orderly and keepeth the law. And as touching the Gentiles, now that's a different category, they're saying, we have written and concluded that you observe no such things, save only that they keep themselves from the things offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. We're not requiring the Gentiles to keep the law, but we are requiring believing Jews to keep the law. That's what we agreed to. That was what was their heart. So will you go along with this, Paul, and will you pay for all the things needed for them to end their vow and join them in that? And then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering should be made for every one of them. If you remember in chapter 18, Paul also had a Nazarite vow on him. Probably one before he got saved but one he was going to keep until the allotted time, his yeas being yeas, his nays, nays. Lord, I'm taking this vow and I'm going to keep myself pure in this way as a Nazarite for so many years. Well, that time was ended, if you remember in chapter 18. And let's just read that one verse, chapter 18 of Acts, verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed on to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Quilla, and having shaved his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. But notice it says nothing about Paul making sacrifice, because he knew that there already was a sacrifice made for sin, and that was Jesus Christ. And it would be wrong to take a lamb and slaughter it for
for a sin offering after Christ already was slaughtered as our sin offering. And it would have been wrong for him, and he didn't do it at his own vow of ending. But because he was persuaded and he had a love and he thought, if this helps them receive my message, then I'll do whatever it takes. Paul, God did not want you to offend his name and sin against your God to reach them. He can reach them without you compromising. Don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul said, I'm going. If you do, you're going to be in prison and chains, and it's going to be a, a rough road to get you to, to Rome, but, but I've ordained that road too, so if you choose that, you're still under my, my sovereignty, but I'm telling you, don't go to Jerusalem. And he went. And he entered into the temple to signify the accomplishments of the days of purification until an offering should be offered for every one of them. Every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were in Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place and further has brought Greeks into the temple, which he didn't, but nevertheless, and brought Greeks into the temple, also into the temple that has polluted this holy place. For they had seen before him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian whom they supposed, boy, don't act on supposition. Don't suppose something happened without the knowledge of it. Well, I think that they did that. And it might not be true. They supposed that Paul had brought into the temple, brought him into the temple, and he didn't. But look at this. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. I told you not to go. You're not to go into the temple and make sacrifice and pay for sacrifice for sin because I paid it all at the cross. And I think Paul was ready to do just that as it states. And the love and the sovereignty of God stepped in, though Paul made his choices, and stopped him from fulfilling and decimating his own faith by, by the sin of an animal sacrifice. And I thought, God, you are so good that even in my choices, how many times have you stepped in and saved my soul? And I deserved, I deserved the end result of my choice and the goodness of God stepped in and delivered me out of it. And I think, God, you are so, so good to me. Help me to not make those choices again, but to listen, to have ears to hear, to obey your word, to follow in your way. But I am so, so grateful for your grace and mercy. His grace and mercy, people, have been upon my life for a lot of years. I must say now decades. And he's pulled me out of my foolish choices and desires. More times than I could tell you. And he's a good, good, gracious, awesome, mighty God. And I just want to encourage you, he is such a good God to you. 
that, that if it were known, I, I would have been dead long ago by my own choice. But yet he stopped my hand. In fact, I guess I got to say, you know what? God over the years has saved me from myself. Not only has he saved me from the wicked one and the enemy and Satan and the people that have come against me, but I think my biggest adversary in life is me. I think I'm my biggest adversary, you know? I, I, I almost am like that little cartoon. I think you should do good and do this. Nah, don't listen to him, you know? You need to do this and have fun. It's what you want. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'll do that. He has saved me from myself over the years. And I believe personally from Scripture, God stepped in. And he saved Paul from making a grave mistake. What a grave mistake for Paul the Apostle to allow animal sacrifice for sin when Jesus already paid it all. As we sang, Jesus paid it all. And as it continues in that song, and all to him I owe. Don't we owe God a lot? I mean, isn't he gracious? Isn't he good? He is so good. Well, why don't we stop there and we'll pick it up next week. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Oh, you're so, so good to us. I made some bad choices over the years, Lord. Maybe some are in one right now. And I pray, Lord, that by your mercy and your grace, which is so abundant and new every morning, that you would save us from ourselves. And that you would set our feet on the right path and move us in the right direction that we can truly obey your will and follow your, your voice and listen to your word. Thank you, Lord. You are our great deliverer from the, the initial deliverance from the, the sin of my soul to the deliverance of every step of my life. I thank you for being such a good, good God. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Kath, why don't you come up and why don't we worship the Lord as we close.